Have you ever wondered if you could be an angel investor? Find out what they teach you at Angel Investing School and the role that social capital and networks play in ensuring the next generation of talent succeeds. I'm Ethan Devitt, and welcome to the 50 Faces podcast, a podcast committed to revealing the richness and diversity of the world of investment and tech by focusing on people and their stories. I'm joined today by Andy Aim MBE, who's an investor and founder who also runs an angel investing school designed to teach people how to invest small tickets in startups effortlessly. He has run the Angel Investing School since January 2020 and is a venture partner and board member of numerous technology companies. Passionate about financial education and entrepreneurship, he's been entrepreneur in residence at accelerators such as Entrepreneur First and One Tech and has spent time as managing director at the London Accelerator Backstage Capital, which focuses on supporting underrepresented founders. He was awarded an MBE in 2020 for services to diversity in technology. Welcome, Andy. Thanks for joining me today. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Well, let's get started with your background and career journey. Can you tell us where you grew up, what you studied, and how you came to enter the world of entrepreneurship and angel investing? Absolutely. So I'm a British-born Ghanaian by heritage, grew up in North London, and was always really passionate about this intersection between technology, business, and, and money essentially, and, and how the three fit together. And looking back, I didn't have the language back then, but I was really fascinated around ownership and equity and why it was so central to wealth creation at a young age. And I remember my dad used to order the FT from our local corner store in Tottenham in North London. And it wasn't something that used to be in stock because people in Tottenham didn't usually read that kind of newspaper. So it was a very specialist order just for my family. And in the weekend, FT always used to show off like middle class lifestyles, talking about the Monaco Grand Prix or about the Chelsea Flower Show. But all of these foreign experiences that I just didn't really understand, but found really inspiring. I think that was my first steps into really uncovering, all right, what does it mean to go from working class to middle class? What does it mean to kind of grow in wealth? What does it mean to own a business and grow a business? So it was my first exposure was actually through reading that paper. And it kind of led to my whole career and the the career that I've gone on to have today. Happy to go deeper into those stories and and tell a bit more about the journey. Well, yeah, I'd particularly love to know, so where you started in this angel investment, it's a landscape, I suppose, spent some early years within accelerators and became entrepreneur in residence. Love to know like some of the lessons you learned across the way, maybe some of the barriers you perceived to underrepresented founders. Absolutely. So I started my first business about 15 years ago called Mixed Day Madness. And it was a central hub online where you could download and stream UK urban and grime music. And I grew up loving this music. Artists like Giggs and Dizzy Rascal and Ed Sheeran. And the list goes on. I just love this music. And there was nowhere online at the time where you could really consume this music. There was dodgy little MySpace websites for those that remember MySpace. There was dodgy little forums. There was not well-maintained artist sites from the labels, but there was no central location online. And this is really telling my age because this predates iTunes and Spotify and the services we have today that make it so easy to stream our favorite music. So we launched this product. We put it out to market. It starts getting some early traction and people start using it. Great. And then we had to figure out our business model behind it so we could actually start monetizing and making money from it. Great. Along this journey, we bootstrapped because we didn't even know the world of angel investing and venture capital exists. And I'm going to double click on that point because there's so many working class entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs from working class backgrounds who don't have access to friends and family a network of ex-entrepreneurs, a network of investors, people they could go to for advice on the journey. And I grew fascinated with democratizing access to that. How can I plug into the network? How can I build these relationships? How can I go on this journey of getting funding or supporting others of doing so? So through feeding my curiosity along the years, after I left Mixtape Madness, I joined an accelerator program. It was called Entrepreneur First. And on this program... I was looking for a co-founder to to go on a new adventure with, but I was a little bit lost. I didn't know what I wanted to work on. I didn't know what industry I wanted to be in. I was more feeding my curiosity and going through this process. I learned two things along that journey. The first is I'm someone that needs to form deep relationships with someone before I can even start a business. So a three-month accelerated process to start a business with someone that I don't know just doesn't work well for me. 
The second thing I learned was that during that experience, I invited Arlen Hamilton, the founder of Backstage Capital, to the UK to plug her into the ecosystem and to have private and public events all around investing into underrepresented founders because I was so passionate about it. It wasn't a paid endeavor. It wasn't something that I was monetizing. It was something that I was doing for the community and for the culture because I cared deeply about it. And during that experience, during one of our meetings at EQT Ventures, which is a VC firm that's based in the UK, but really invests across Europe, like Series A and Plus. I'm in the meeting room of her and a few of the other investors. I remember Ada Ventures were in the room at the time. I remember Zoe Xavier, who's now at Sequoia, was in the room at the time, Andy Davis. And during that meeting, Arlen said, he doesn't know it yet, but I want to make Andy the managing director of Backstage Capital. And I want to support him in starting our accelerator programs. So I've gone on this wonderful journey now with Backstage, because I did accept the role, to launch these accelerator programs in Detroit, Philadelphia, LA, and in London. And for those listening who are unaware of what an accelerator program is, it's a startup program that usually lasts for about three months, where you have a mixture of curriculum and content to learn about how to build a business, but you also get funding to support you financially with getting started with building a business. And then you also have some sort of mentorship where you can learn from more experienced operators and entrepreneurs along that experience. The whole goal is to help you go from zero to one in launching your product, getting in the hands of customers and getting the traction and evidence you need to help build your case to get your fundraising closed and, and raise some money for your business. So we launched this program. We raised two and a half million dollars. We invested a hundred thousand dollars into each of the startups and it looks like it's going swimmingly well. The biggest problem that I learned from working hand-to-hand, one-on-one with each of the startups was they couldn't close their rounds. Yeah, that 100K check was great, but who else am I going to turn to for the rest of the 200K that I'm trying to raise in this round? So that inspired me to start my next venture and the venture that I run today, which is the Angel Investing School. And we're essentially creating those friends and family rounds for these founders. We're training diverse operators, whether you're a product manager, a management consultant, a banker, a lawyer, a nurse, a property investor. We're training these people to get started with investing into startups. We have public programs every April and September, as well as corporate programs to really galvanize, empower, and educate people on getting started with investing into startups. The reason this is important is because less than 2% of venture capital goes to people of color, and less than one P in every pound goes to all female teams. So my hypothesis is that if we can train up more women, we can train up more people of color, we're therefore going to have that second order effect of backing these diverse founders. And so far, it's been proven true because over the two and a half years of running this business, we've trained over 350 new angel investors and they've invested over $3 million into over 150 startups. 70% of the people that we trained are people of color and 49% are women and 1% away from our target. So I'm proud of the impact that we've had today. And we worked with some great organizations like Google's Black Network, who have gone on to launch the Black Angel Group, have invested $2 million into 22 startups over the last 15 months off the back of one of our programs. So seeing this activation really makes me proud when people are putting into practice what they're learning and creating this economic empowerment. Absolutely extraordinary, the impact that you've made and really plugging in. It, it, would, it wouldn't seem in theory that 200000 is that difficult to raise. But as we know, when you're that founder going door to door and this kind of hand to hand image, I'm thinking of hand to hand combat, because it's kind of like that. It is grueling and each one is is testing and energy sucking and it's difficult. I'd love to walk through the angel investing school, because what does it take to be an angel investor? What kind of personal resources are the kind of the minimum that maybe an angel investor would need to be thinking about writing those checks? And can you maybe walk us through that training because maybe I'll join you. If you get you that 49% into 50, it does seem like an extraordinary program. Yeah, thank you very much. So firstly, with the Angel Investing School, we often approach people who are feeling like people like me don't invest. I can't afford to invest and I can't add value to entrepreneurs. And we demystify all three of them because we prove that anyone can invest. Diverse people can invest. Women can invest and should invest. Ownership is important, okay? We prove that you don't have to be rich to get started. In the UK, the FCA, which is the Financial Conduct Authority, 
have set the regulation and the rules around who can become a sophisticated investor. And it states that in the UK, you can either be a high net worth individual, so someone that owns 250K or more in assets apart from their residential home, or you could be a sophisticated investor, which is someone that's been a part of an angel group for six months or more, including the angel investing school, or you've made an investment before into a privately held company, such as on an equity crowdfunding platform where you can literally invest hundreds, or you've worked in the private equity or financial services industry, so you're aware of the risk that you're taking in making these investments, or you earn over £100,000 or more a year. So you can see with the criteria in the UK actually is much more accessible getting into angel investing. In the US, there's higher barriers to entry because they have something called the US Securities Exchange Commission, which is their equivalent of the FCA. And they state that you have to earn at least $200,000 a year, or you and your spouse need a combined income of $300,000 or more. That is a barrier to entry. The history behind that barrier is that they were trying to keep the wealth between the bourgeoisie, the wealth between the elite, the wealth between the higher classes. So it makes it less accessible for others to access this asset class. And the Wall Street Journal in 2019 published an excerpt from Uber's cap table, the list of investors that invested into Uber. And it showed people such as Michael Oren, who had invested $5,000 into Uber, it changed into 24 million by 2019 because these people had access. And that's why access is such an important point to double click on. Investing in startups isn't only about just throwing your money at any startup that you know within your network. It's about you doing your due diligence, you learning the skills and the education you need to know to assess an entrepreneur, you developing the skills to find that entrepreneur, understanding how you can add value and support that entrepreneur along the journey, and going through a transaction of doing a deal in the right way to invest into that entrepreneur. So when I talk through the curriculum, that's exactly what we cover. Right. So our curriculum covers really eight key phases across the transaction of actually getting the deal done. The first is we start with the history and overview of what angel investing is and really understanding your motivation behind why you want to get started. Because often with some of these deals that you're going to be doing as an angel investor, you need to think in terms of portfolio rather than single deals, because a lot of startups end up failing to make a return for an investor. So you need a portfolio in order to diversify and spread the risk and heighten your chances of even making a return. The second thing we touch on is really developing your investment thesis. Like what are you going to focus on investing in and why? And there's a lot of details in our template that we go through in, in a very interactive exercise to really shape what geography are you investing in? How much is your check size? How much are you going to invest monetarily? What type of industries are you going to invest in and why? Like, how do you feel like you can add value? What is going to be your edge? We go through all of these kind of factors when shaping you and developing your thesis. And then we go into sourcing and assessing deals. Where do you find great entrepreneurs? And how do you do your homework on making a decision whether you want to invest or not? Following that, we look into transaction economics and valuations. Like, how are valuations set? What is the fundamentals of a cap table? What is the dilution and why is it important to understand? Return expectations when you're doing deals, okay? Then we go through the legal process. Actually, what's the key documents that you need when doing a deal? What's the key terms for you to be aware of? What's the difference between a common or ordinary shares versus preference shares and why does it matter? What do VCs invest as versus an angel investor? And then following that, we look at tax relief specifically for the UK. So what's SEIS and EIS, these acronyms? What do they mean? How do they work? How can I benefit from them? Not a lot of people know that you can get up to 50% back in tax rebate when you invest into startups here in the UK. That's a fantastic offer. That means that I can invest £10,000 into a startup and get up to 5000 back off my tax. That's an incredible opportunity to encourage investment here in the UK ecosystem. And then we go into adding value beyond capital, shaking off those limiting beliefs, and really shaking off that imposter syndrome to understand all of the small ways you can add value from amplifying a job post to replying to an email and, and just being there to listen to a founder, to sharing an answer to a question, you know, like, how can I make remote work and work for my company? Ah, I know how I've worked in several remote companies. Right. And then finally, we go into how do you structure your deal and take advantage of deal structuring platforms such as Vaben, Odin, Branch and many more. 
And then finally, our bonus lesson is all about building your brand. How do you build an attractive angel investor brand? At the heart and core of our message there is if you're great and in service to founders, they're always going to spread the good word about you. It's word of mouth market and it's the same way great products spread. People tell you about it because they love the experience so much. It's a very comprehensive. And I'd imagine also many of these angel investors are still very much involved in driving their own careers as well as doing angel investing. So some of these insights and networks could be very beneficial to their other activities, their day jobs, maybe not just their angel Absolutely. investing. Absolutely. And what do you coach them around hit rate and you know, loss expectation? Yeah, so the, the two things that go in hand are your primary motivations for starting and return expectations. So let's start with primary motivations for investing. It could be because you're altruistic. You grew up in a certain area and you want to invest back into companies in that area. I grew up in Manchester. I want to invest back into Manchester-based companies. That's theoretical, not true. It could also be because perhaps you've experienced a capital event yourself. You worked in a high-growth startup. They've actually listed on a public stock exchange. You've made some money and you want to invest into entrepreneurs. It could be because you're passionate about learning about new technology like Web3 and blockchain. And you want to participate in that learning by investing into that technology. It's like taking an MBA, but on your own accord. It could be also a, a secondary motivator that you want to make some money in a different way, in an interesting and engaging way, because you get a front row seat to building a business when you go on these fascinating journeys with interesting founders. So everyone's going to have their own motivation that's personal to them. But that baseline will also correlate of your return expectations. Because for some people, even if they make a loss, they get the minimum value, which is enough for them, of going on these incredible journeys with these founders. For others, it's too much to bear and therefore it may not be the right asset class for them. When we look at return expectations, we refer to this famous phrase in the VC land around the power law distribution. And what this law dictates is that actually there's going to be a small number of companies that really provide the returns to cover the losses across your portfolio. So imagine you invested in an Uber in 2010 when it was just getting started. Uber, if it was in your portfolio, made you so much money that accounts and covers for all of the losses that you made across the 10 other investments that you may have made in that same year. And that's what a power law distribution holds. And that's why it's important to understand that you need to build a diverse portfolio. Your hit mate rate might be that you go into your portfolio and 50% fail to make a return. The remaining 30% maybe go on to make 1x or 2x, and maybe just the two remaining companies go on to 10x or more. But because you've had a portfolio to spread the risk, you've had a higher probability of getting to those returns, and you've limited your risk exposure of being almost just concentrated into one, one single company. An analogy for how this works in the public domain when looking at public equities is ETFs or managed funds, where you have an opportunity to invest once, into a list of companies like an ETF such as the S&P 500, where I'm essentially listing in, investing into the 500 companies on the S&P, right? So that's like the equivalent of building your diversified portfolio as, a, as an angel investor to really spread the risk and heighten your probability of returns. We are now going to take a short break to speak with the sponsor of this series about what it is that makes them unique. I sat down with Tom Raber of Alvine Capital. So Alpine Capital has a unique business model that you call reverse inquiry. Can you tell us what reverse inquiry means? When we were marketing or softly marketing funds, we realized that some institutional investors felt that they were being pushed and every call was the same as the one they just had. And we felt that we had to have another approach to institutional investors and so we try to really go behind the scenes and ask them, what exactly are you looking for? If you had a dream scenario and you had an opening in your fund, what would you like to have and how would that fund look? And when we got investors to open up and explain to us what they wanted, we then took down all the information we needed and we went out into the market. It's a pull sale rather than a push sale. You're actually helping the investor finding something that's better than, than they thought that when they were looking for in the first place. In terms of your client base, so you work with a lot of Scandinavian and Northern European institutions. Is there anything on their mind today? We opened an office in Stockholm last year. 
We have Nordic roots. We have obviously uh, Nordic speaking people in London as well. We've covered the region for many years. Yes, we know it very well. What are they looking for? What's happening up in that part of the world is that they're a leader in anything that's ESG and impact. Some very large institutions have decided not to do anything at all unless it's completely impact, completely green. Everyone is looking for good, well-performing private equity and private credit funds. And we're fortunate that we're working with both uh, in both categories. At the moment, we have a very good selection there. And now, back to the show. Let's talk about the impact then. So you mentioned getting these angel circles to plug that gap, perhaps, that 200,000 that may have been missing. How then does this, I suppose, set up the founders to consolidate and get that growth underway and move to the next level? How have you seen the impact of this angel investing? This is a great question, like all of your questions, of course. And what's important to understand is when you're building a business, you're often cash-strapped, resource-strapped, and you have more ambition than you can meet. So you can have a roadmap of all of these things that you want to get done. And you realize that you need to build a team in order to execute on this roadmap. I might need to hire two developers. I might to hire a designer. But I haven't got the money in the business right now. And I'm competing against the market of other businesses that are more funded than I am who are taking this talent and executing on their roadmap. So you want to realize that opportunity sooner. So you want to raise some money in order to start to realize that opportunity. Maybe you had some early traction. Maybe you had your first 10 customers. Maybe you've proven that there's something worthwhile here. You just need some money in order to really get off the ground and really grow your business. Another thing you may need the money for is because you might want to do additional marketing. How can I acquire more customers? How can I put more money and effort into marketing so that I can actually compete against better funded competitors again? Right. It might be because you might need to do some R&D because you're a deep tech company and you've got some patents that you need to file and patents aren't free. So in order to do that research, in order to file those patents, you might need to tap into some funding. And the funding that you require depends on the needs for you as a business and where you are on your journey. It might be for the R&D and the research, you tap into some grants from Innovate UK. It might be for your creative business that you tap into funding from the Arts Council. That's non-dilutive. It might be for your e-commerce business that you tap into revenue-based financing. It might be for your retail business that you tap into invoice factoring or working capital loans. It might be actually for your high growth tech startup, your software as a service, you're tapping into angel investment with an aspiration to tap into venture capital. So all of these different versions of funding just depend on what type of business you are, what stage you are of growth, and what your appetite is for risk. Fascinating. And just that social capital, that mosaic that you're creating, clearly the referrals and just the kind of opening, I suppose, of doors is so much a huge part of that. Absolutely. We'd love to get back to some personal reflections now, because clearly you're a force in the industry and a mentor to many. Have there been any mentors for you? Were there any key people who got you started, who kind of made you see the world differently? Absolutely. I'm a big fan in giving people their flowers while they're still here. So one of the first mentors along my journey was a gentleman called Francis Maynou. And he works in private equity, he's an originator, but he was the person that helped me translate and understand the working world, the city, what M&A is, what auditing is, what management consulting is. So he allowed me to really understand in a safe space and ask those stupid questions in order to really understand what different career paths meant. And then he introduced me to people that did the roles that I was looking to get into, which was management consulting at the start of my career. And that made a transformative difference to me getting into my first career because I had access to those people. And that was such a pivotal moment for me, having someone like Francis in my corner, because there's so many people that were like me that had high potential, but low access to people like that, and therefore low access to opportunities. So I recognize the privilege I've had because I've had people like Francis in my corner. When I look at modern day, there's people such as Anika Henry, who worked at Google, who helped me launch the Angel Investing School into Google's Black Network. And we trained over 100 Black Googlers thanks to this work that we've done together. So again, another person along the way who I have to give my flowers to. And then ultimately, my parents, both my mother and my father, were great role models for me along the way. Having two parents in a household, again, is a real privilege in this day and age. But having my mom having such a strong faith base in Christianity, keeping me humble, and my dad, such a diligent worker, just really helped me to lay the foundations around values and connecting with people on a human level so that it's relationship-based and not transactional when I'm angel investing today. 
And this wasn't a, a scripted question, but it just occurred to me, you were awarded your MBE in 2020. So COVID was just emerging. Obviously, that put us all uh, asunder in terms of our normal in-person networks. Have you found since then that that has opened up yet again more networks for you? Yeah, so COVID was interesting because I started doubling down on some new skills such as remote facilitation and using digital whiteboards. And like you said, having authentic connections with people remotely. And I remember this weird chasm, and I don't know if you experienced this as well, where I started meeting people in real life in person that I felt like I knew so well because I had met them so much online, right? And I was like, I thought you were taller. I thought you were shorter. I didn't know you looked like that. And you just embrace each other, that like you've known each other for years because of how well you felt connected with each other over Zoom, right? And I don't think there's anything that can actually replace the physical connection you can have with someone. But I think we've learned in a hybrid way how we can complement the in-person connections with how we collaborate online. And just moving on from the mentorship question, obviously, I'm sure you've met with many people who've shared much wisdom. Would you say there was any one piece of advice you received that made an impact on how you work or see the world or any creed or motto that you live by now? Yeah, there's a few, but I'll pick one. I always talk to a lot of my mentees around measuring my life in decades and not days and making sure that we're playing the long game. Is this, I guess, mentality of always like thinking long term around the arc of your life and where you're trying to go to rather than making just decisions that benefit your short term and sacrifice in the long term? Because often it's a game of inches that compounds over a number of years. And would you say there's any advice you would have for your younger self, for that young boy reading the FT in Tottenham? Anything you know now that you wish you had known then? I just trust the process. I think sometimes we can get wrapped up with doubting ourselves, that imposter syndrome. You just got to trust the process, be consistent, deliver quality consistently, and and it works out. Everything is figure outable. Well, just as we bring our discussion to an end, one of the oft quoted phrases is that talent is universal, opportunity is not. And I think what I'm also learning from you is that access to opportunity and access to people are kind of slightly two different things in the sense that you can have opportunity with people, sometimes equal opportunity, and access to people may not be universal either. And I read this great description of Melody Hobson, who's a very prominent Mm -hmm. Black leader in the US, and just how her life was charted by being introduced to influential people who saw how amazing she was and then made a further introduction. And that is the story of how she entered Starbucks, and now she's chairman of the board there, as well as media companies and and a number of other Mm -hmm. leadership roles. So having that kind of warm word from somebody who sees your brilliance, recognizes it, is so key. Is there anything in terms of maybe networks that aspiring entrepreneurs or angel investors besides your angel investing school should be aware of any groups that you think do a good job of getting the word out? Sure. Yeah. So angel investing school aside, firstly, the Melody Hobson has a great TED talk, as you know, around being color brave and not color blind. So I highly encourage people to tune into that. So yeah, there's a few networks. It just depends on your interest areas. So actually coming up in a month's time is London Tech Week. It's a great opportunity to plug into the ecosystem, experience the London startup scene and really get to grips with startups and the activity here in London. So I highly encourage people to plug into that. We also have a government-backed program called London and Partners, which is a great program for those companies that want to internationalize or for when international companies are set up in the UK for the first time, whether it's Uber or TikTok. So it's a great opportunity and network there as well for founders. For Black founders and Black professionals, there's great networks such as BYP Network, as well as Google's Black Founders Fund, which is a program that I've been supporting for years. There's also the Black Equity Organization as well. And actually, in my newsletter every Monday morning, which is all about my personal musings, I share out a lot of events that are coming up and worthwhile news articles worth reading. So I share a lot of activity and, and opportunities, especially for diverse entrepreneurs every week. Too many to stay on top of here in this conversation. Well, we're going to link to all of that in the show notes. And of course, we did already interview Kike on a window from the BYP, who's making a massive impact. So we'll put the link to that podcast in the show notes. And I just want to thank you, Andy, for the extraordinary impact you're having in the work you're doing. I've learned a lot in terms of what it takes to be an angel investor. I think you've busted some myths here and look forward to seeing your star continue to rise. Thank you for sharing your insights here. It's genuinely my pleasure and and it's a pleasure to serve. So I love being of service to people and, and having platforms like this to really spread the good word. So thank you.
I'm Ethan Devitt. Thank you for listening to the 50 Faces podcast. If you liked what you heard and would like to tune in to hear more inspiring investors on their personal journeys, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, wherever you got your podcasts. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be construed as investment advice and all views are personal and should not be attributed to the organizations and affiliations of the host or any guest.